as people are getting to your seats, I'd just like to welcome you back to this gorgeous spring morning in Milwaukee. Um, this is really uh, sunbathing weather for those of us who live here. <laughs> so give you an idea of what we've been facing. Um, so welcome to uh, day two of After Extinction. And, and today, as it turns out, is our art day. So Joanna Zelinska will be talking about photography uh, in our first plenary. We'll then have two art present, artist presentations or one performance presentation uh, in the next session. And then, as I mentioned on uh, Thursday at uh, 4 o'clock, we'll head down to Innova, the Institute of Visual Arts, to uh, have an artist tour, talk, uh, and look at placing the golden spike, uh, the exhibit there about the Anthropocene. So enough of me. Uh, Jennifer? Thanks, Richard. Good morning, everybody. I had the great pleasure of meeting Joanna Zielinska a couple years ago at the complete other end of the world. We were just talking about this. It really is the most remote place on Earth, I feel like. Perth, Western Australia, which uh, is where Symbiotica, the great art research lab, happens to be. So we find ourselves making this trek. Um, but it was there that I first heard her speak about A Minimal Ethics for the Anthropocene, the title and subject of her latest book, which is freely available for download on the Open Humanities Press. Her insistence on what it would mean to live and to live well at this precarious geohistorical moment when life as we know it is under threat. Indeed, as we come to recognize that human to non-human life, as well as the entanglements between our but temporary stabilizations and material incisions, remains an enduring threat across much of her recent work. But her minimal ethics aren't just offered in words. For interspersed throughout the pages are Joanna's own photographs from a series of composite images that visualize interwoven human and non-human landscapes from various vantage points inside and outside a window. As a writer, lecturer, as well as artist and curator, Joanna works in the areas of new technologies and new media, ethics, photography, and art. She's professor of new media and communications at Goldsmiths, University of London, and the author of five books, including Minimal Ethics for the Anthropocene, as well as Life After New Media, Mediation as a Vital Process, as a Vital Process, with Sarah Kember, and Bioethics in the Age of New Media. She is also the editor of the Cyborg Experiments, The Extensions of the Body in the Media Age, a collection of essays on the work of performance artists Stellark and Orlan, and co-editor of Imaginary Neighbors, Mediating Polish-Jewish Relations After the Holocaust. She has published a translation of Stanislaw Lem's major philosophical treatise, Summa Technologiae, while her own work has been translated into Chinese, French, German, Norwegian, Polish, Russian, and Turkish. Together with Claire Birchall and Gary Hall, she oversees the Living Books About Life project, which is really great, you should all check that out. Um, it's a series of over 20 electronic open access books, which provide a bridge between the humanities and the sciences. She's one of the editors of Culture Machine, an international open access journal of culture and theory, and curator of its sister project, Photomediations Machine. But in addition to and complementing her philosophical writing, she has a very active photographic art practice and is also engaged in curatorial work. In 2013, she was artistic director of Biomediations, the Festival of New Media Art and Video in Mexico City. Now she's currently working on photographing media entanglements, writing a book on non-human photography, and editing Photomediations, an open book. So please join me in warmly welcoming Joanna Zelenska. Thank you, Jennifer, for such a generous introduction. And I wanted to also say thank you to Emily Clark and Richard Grusin for inviting me here. And I'm really excited to, to be here in the middle of non-human things, in the center for non-human things. And also thank you to Annette Hess for organizing all the different bits of my trip, which has all been very efficient and very smooth. Um, in this talk, I will take the horizon of extinction as a reference point against which I will think the ontology of photography and its agency. I will explore what photography can do with and to the world, what it can cast light on, and what the role of light is in approaching questions of life and death on a planetary scale. Considering the history of photography as part of the broader nature cultural history of our planet, I will trace parallels between photographs and fossils and read photography 
as a light-induced process of fossilization occurring across different media. Seen from this perspective, photography will be presented as containing an actual material record of life, rather than just its memory trace. But I will also go back to photography's original embracing of the natural light emanating from the sun to explore the extent to which photographic practice can tell us something about energy sources and about our relation to the star that nourishes our planet. Well, we have obviously always lived in the time after extinction and hence under its horizon. Five mass extinctions are said to have taken place, as you will all know, during the history of our planet, each wiping out significant populations of living beings. But extinction, as it was already discussed yesterday, is a process rather than an event. It's an inextricable part of the natural selection that drives evolution. Indeed, geologists talk about background extinction, a prolonged course of action unfolding across scales of cosmic time with the average background extinction rate of mammals roughly calculated as 0.25 per million species years. Mass extinctions, of which we are currently said to be awaiting the sixth, can therefore be described as moments of intensification on the timeline time of continuous exploratory duration. At the same time, even though we have always lived after extinction, extinction didn't enter our conceptual spectrum until the 18th century, when it was brought in to provide an explanation for the existence of fossils, for which no living correlates could be found. Curiously, the awareness of extinction as a biogeological fact doesn't seem to have become fully embraced by the human population even today. Biologist Ilka Hansky claims that due to human cognitive incapacity to perceive large-scale and long-term changes, our present grasping of significant <laughs> geological transformations is very limited. And as the apparent stability of the current state of the world is deceiving our senses, we have failed to develop a responsible long-term response to climate change. So extinction, we could say, is one of these facts that we both know and don't know about. And we are kind of able, as a species, to uh, kind of incorporate and, and embrace that cognitive paradox, knowing and not knowing, and it manifests itself in different sets of behaviors. So this is why the looming prospect of the human influence sixth extinction is something we can so easily remove from our consciousness even if we have heard the facts, seen the simulations, and studied the data. Dwelling under the horizon of extinction without turning our gaze away from it therefore presents itself as an ethical task, as well as a condition of any meaningful non-parochial politics. But if we are to devise a truly cosmic politics for the humans of here and now, but also for our human and non-human descendants, we need to force ourselves to combat our cognitive and sensory limitations in order to grasp extinction not just as a concept, but also as a set of material conditions. This exercise in imagining extinction, including the extinction of our own species, undertaken as part of this conference could be a first step in this process. Naturally, there is something self-defeating about the exercise in philosophizing across cosmic scales. It forces us to acknowledge that, after the extinction of the human, once the rats or the microbes have inherited the Earth, there will be no one to do philosophy or art, at least in the way we humans have shaped these practices. This is not to suggest that the event of human extinction will be more dramatic for the ecosphere as a whole than the previous extinctions. Dinosaurs will, of course, have cared about the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction much more. Uh, but rather to reintroduce the human standpoint to the theorization of extinction as a concept and a problem. This is why I wanted to join kind of Bill's Entangled Humanism yesterday, it was as a way of, kind of reintroducing the human in the kind of or through the framework of, of post-humanist or post-anthropocentric critique. So I'm proposing to do this not in order to inject kind of unreconstructed humanism, but in order to avoid what Donna Haraway has criticized as a view from nowhere, a view which ends up smuggling, uh, smuggling back the usually white, white, straight, male, human into the debate under the umbrella of its supposed non-human perspective. 
So with this reservation in mind, I would like to pick up the exhortation issued by the Center for the 21st Century Studies here at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to think of the event of extinction not as destructive or final, but as generative, and to consider what happens to writing, theory, and philosophy, but also to art and photography as devices for enabling a radically different set of arrangements for the world, aka a radically different politics, after thinking the event of extinction. Jan Zalasiewicz, a UK expert on the Anthropocene, claims that the extraordinary geological significance of the current period in which the human has become an agent of geological change will be reflected in the fossils left to future generations. As Elizabeth Colbert no, um, aptly highlights, a hundred million years from now, all that we consider to be the great works of man, the sculptures and the libraries, the monuments and the museums, the cities and the factories, will be compressed into a layer of sediment, not much thicker than a cigarette paper. It is the question of the material manifestation of the geological significance of our current period that is of particular interest to me here, precisely because it allows us to confront the transience of our human needs, desires, and memories with a more permanent record of human and non-human life that endures in time. If we think of ter in terms of deep history, we can say that the past leaves an imprint of itself in the rocks, or even, although this may perhaps yet still seem like an association too far, that the past photographs itself. Yet in what follows, I will argue that the link between fossilization and photography is more than just a metaphor, and that this conceptualization can tell us something new, both about the photographic medium and about its conditions, which are also the conditions of our existence, light, energy, the sun. The manner of thinking about media in geological terms inscribes itself in what UC Parica identifies as the wider drive towards geological and geophysical metaphors in media arts and technological discussions. This drive can be accounted for by the fact that science itself implicitly perceived the Earth as media, analyzing it as it did and still does as in fossils in terms of records, indices, and biofilms. Writing, reading, and interpretation therefore seem to reside at the very heart of what becomes known as earth sciences. Indeed, John Darren Peters explains that both for Darwin and his close friend, Charles Lyell, known as the founder of <coughs> geology, earth is a recording medium. Yet Darren Peters also reminds us that knowledge isn't necessarily historical, even in sciences where history might seem irrelevant. The universe is a text, a distorted text, that comes from afar, a classic hermeneutical situation. This conclusion should not be seen as an attempt to reduce everything to textuality, as some proponents of uh, so-called new materialism sometimes seem to apply, but rather as an intimation that the universe presents itself to us through the tropes, tools, and media we ourselves have forged as part of our becoming human. It may indeed present and reveal itself entirely differently to different species or classes of beings, but our knowledge of that presentation will be limited to the material and conceptual tools at our disposal, including our very concepts of knowledge and writing, as well as presentation. Photography as drawing with light has been intrinsically connected with inscription from its early days. Yet the actual process of making a mark on the photo and light sense of the surface was originally seen as a function of a non-human agent. In the aptly titled The Pencil of, Pencil of Nature, one of the first commercially available books of photography published between 1844 and 46, it was kind of serialized in magazines, William Henry Fox Talbot writes that the plates of this work have been obtained by the mere action of light upon sensitive paper. They are impressed by nature's hand. The leaning of marks can be cultivated, but as Talbot himself discovered in the context of his self-avowed inability to draw well, nature beats the human in precision stakes. It's illustrated by the examples uh, of images of landscapes, people, architecture, and still lives included in the pencil of nature. The eye of the camera is more accurate and more powerful than the human eye. Talbot was very, mu very much aware of the fragility of the resultant photographic recordings. Indeed, 
He put much effort into trying to reduce this fragility and to fix an image on paper uh, for a prolonged period of time, i.e. kind of to discover the process of, of photography, if you like. And as we know, Talbot is one of the many who claim the title, you know, being a discoverer of photography is quite a crowded field around the time. But the very idea of light acting as the pencil of nature, making semi-permanent inscriptions to be detected and interpreted by others, positions photography in its nascent state alongside the then newly emergent discipline of geology, with Lyell's Principles of Geology having been published between 1830 and 33, and resulting in photographs being seen at the time as thin fossils. So let us dwell for a moment on this link between photography and geology as different forms of temporal impression by turning to the work of William Jerome Harrison, an English scientist, teacher, and writer. In the late 88, 1880s, Harrison authored two seemingly unrelated volumes that refle reflected his personal and professional interests, a sketch of the geology of Leicestershire and Rutland, um, and a history of photography. In his intricate reading of Harrison's work, Adam Bobet shows how for Harrison, photography and geology are constituted by similar processes. Now, the history of photography, you can download it from the Gutenberg project, uh, the other one as well. I mean, um, it's full of painstaking details, but rather tame conceptually. But the prose in history of photography occasionally raises to quasi sublime heights in an attempt to say something bigger about the material at hand. So it's mainly descriptions of different chemical processes. And it's quite a formulaic book with lots of different sections of this chemical, that chemical, another chemical. If you like chemicals, I'm sure you're going to like this book. <laughs> but what's amazing for me, who doesn't know so much about chemicals perhaps, is an attempt to frame it, to present it as a work of scholarship. And Harrison was a kind of, he was a scientist, but he was also kind of an, a gentleman scholar, if you like, of a particular kind of breeding class. He was an educator. So amongst the, uh, the thorough accounts of the different methodologies of the dry and wet photograph processes, Harrison boldly pronounces that there is nothing new under the sun, especially in photography. Mm. This link is not just metaphorical. Harrison characterizes the protagonist of the art form as apprentices of impressions. According to his assessment, impressioning is a process as ancient as the tanning of human skin under the sun or the bleaching of wax by the sun. In each case, the sun has created an impression on a body. For Harrison, as Bobet says, this was the earliest and most basic form of photography. Specifically, Harrison looks at the working processes of one of the many simultaneous inventors of photography, Nicephor Niepce. Niepce's account of photography, called heliography or sun writing, in which light acts chemically upon bodies, solidifies them, and renders them more or less insoluble, provides another link between photography and fossilization. This link becomes even more evident once we take into account the fact that Niepce studied lithographic forms of imagery production, the geological implications of which are evident. Litho is Greek for stone, and lithography is the process of imprinting an image onto a stone. Niepce considered radically that light could be substituted for human labor as the agent for copying images into stone. We could therefore conclude that, for Harrison, the history of photography is literally a geological history, while Harrison himself becomes the first narrator of the non-human history of photography. In the closing words of history of photography, he considers the photographic process to be part and parcel of the geological history of the Earth, pointing out how beautifully it exemplifies the theory of evolution, process rising out of process. Via its link with fossils, Photography reveals itself to be also coupled with extinction. In making this link, not only does Harrison pinpoint the non-human element of the photographic inscription, but he also seems to intimate that photography has always been there, in cosmic deep time. It just needed to be discovered and then fixed for a little longer, rather than invented. If photography and fossilization are both practices of the impression of softer organisms onto harder geological forms, photography is not a new process, but instead a modern mediated extension of the ancient long impressioning activity enabled by light, soil, and various minerals. 
The human element comes into the picture literally as the apprentice to impressions enabled by the technical material apparatus of the camera, plate, chemicals and light. Now this step into deep time on Harrison's part but also on my part here is an attempt to go beyond the history of photography as part of human history, one that is primarily driven by human motivations and needs. Andre Bazin's argument in which photography, together with other plastic arts, is linked with the practice of embalming the dead as a way of achieving victory over time, can be seen as the key representative of the humanist approach. Even though something resembling geological vocabulary of impressions does enter by Bazin's discourse, with photography being described as a kind of decal or transfer, resembling a fingerprint and contributing something to the order of natural creation, the process is ultimately linked by Bazin to the human's deep need to have the last word in the argument with death. It's precisely this understanding of photography both as an attempt to overcome death and a constant reminder of it that has set the tone for the discourse on this medium in the 20th century. No text made this link more explicit and conserved it for future scholars of photography more strongly than the celebrated Camera Lucida by Roland Barthes. Barthes' slim volume, as you all know, is a meditation on the death of his mother, prompted by seeing a photograph of her, which we never see, uh, and more broadly, on images as affective devices that become placeholders for melancholia and mourning. Yet this narrative, as the very choice of image, as well as the very choice of images in Camera Lucida, end up confining photography to a permanent struggle against death. The photographic medium thus becomes a memory aid and a mausoleum, with life preserved as a death mask. An attempt to tell a deep history of photography as part of the history of the earth, the way I'm attempting to do it here via, via the work of Harrison, a history that transcends human desires and needs, can therefore allow us to outline a different approach to the photographing medium and process. If we recognize that the earth is a source of invention through the entanglements of form and matter, while the sun is a source of energy and ultimately, on this, and ultimately life on this earth, we can read photography as partaking of their vibrant and life-giving rather than just life-conserving properties. From the perspective of cosmic time, fossilization can therefore be seen not just as the preservation of life, but also as the transmission of its evolutionary principle, with all the non-linear non unpredictability and diversity it entails. It's therefore perhaps apposite to try, together with Claire Colebrook, to imagine a species after humans reading our planet and its archive. If they encounter human texts, writes Colebrook, ranging from books to machines to fossil records, how might new views or theories open up? One attempt to envisage such an archive was recently undertaken by photographer Hiroshi Sugimoto in the exhibition Lost Human Genetic Archive, held at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris in 2014. The concept of fossilization underpins the whole of Sugimoto's oeuvre. Fossils work almost the same way as photography, as a record of history. Uh, to me, photography functions as a fossilization of time, he says. But in Sugimoto's images, fossilization as a way of recording time becomes more than just a figure of speech. As explained in a leaflet accompanying his show called Still Live in London, the fossil is both a historical fact and a photographic conceit for the artist serving as a living record and point of departure into history, uh, crystallizing a moment in time into its singular object. Lost human genetic archive dispels with the minimalism and visual elegance of Sugimoto's photographic projects, such as theaters, which you may be familiar with, or dioramas, photographs of dioramas in museums, by presenting the visitor with a rich and diverse collection of objects amassed by the artist over time and arranged into a series of tableaux. Placed somewhere between Dante's Inferno and an enormous toy shop that are both Barbie dolls and sex dolls on display, uh, the cavernous basement of Palais de Tokyo presented a wunderkammer for the age of extinction, in which new things popped up from around every crevice and corner on their way to go out with a bang. 
Each little room in this show stayed an alternative just after the extinction scenario. Yes, we are going to die, Sujimoto, the roguish curator of doom, seemed to want to remind us, but what a blast we've had. And yet, he frowned, look what a mess we've made. This dual emotion of playfulness and melancholia was conveyed by the conflicting visuality of the setup. The visitors wandered around corrugated metal, -like, metal maze-like structures to be constantly presented with amazing objects, fossils from the Cambrian to the Eocene, piles of electronic waste, one of Sujimoto's own seascapes. In what was perhaps a variation on the established trope of the sublime in art, whereby the work evokes pleasure and pain for aesthetic as well as moral effect, Sujimoto mischievously declared, Imagining the worst conceivable tomorrow gives me tremendous pleasure. <laughs> Yet the exploratory fun offered by the artist to the visitors to this lunar park of the Anthropocene carried a serious message. Where is this human race heading, incapable of preventing itself from being destroyed in the name of unchecked growth? <coughs> Minneapolis-based artist Alexa Horokowski recently re visually restrained project Club Disminution, a club of diminishing returns, instigated during her residency at Casa Poli in Chile, offers an interesting counterpart to Sujimoto's opulent archive. Club Disminution takes to the task the modernist dream of an ideal society which was to be achieved thanks to the developments in technology and engineering. Casa Poli, a minimalist cement cube, stands on a jagged cliff overlooking the Pacific, both foregrounding and suspending the differentiation between the human made and what the human calls nature. By blurring the boundaries between development and evolution, Horohowski has opened a rift in the modernist narrative of the seamless unification between citizens and their environment, with a promised Corbusierian order resulting in a haunted space exposed to the elements. Staying in this modernist masterpiece, literally purged at the end of, edge of the world, the artist polluted its visual and conceptual purity with objects and materials found outdoors. Rubbish, fossils, kelp. It is the latter material that provides a conceptual thread for the Club Disminution show, first stage in 2014 at the Soap Factory in Minneapolis, one of the many places of traditional industrial production, now regenerated into cultural industry zones. Kel, or Cocha Yuyo, as it is known in Chile, is a show, a show seaweed that resembles a, th a thick cable and that arranges itself into unusual quasi-sculptural tangles. Attracted to its rubbery texture and its strange beauty, in the early stages of the project, Horohowski started collecting the plant in large amounts and then hanging it in various places in the white cube of Casa Poli. Kochayuyu is a plant that could easily pass for a technological object, thus became an inspiration for her to interrogate the intertwining of nature and culture, extinction and obsolescence. The visitors to Horohowski's exhibition in Minneapolis were greeted by large screen videos showing this cable-like product, with images cut and mirrored on screen to form a kaleidoscope of poetic movement. These were accompanied by another playful take on modernist visual art, cube-like sculptures which may have been made of kelp, cable or metal wire. Even if we touched them, we were not really sure. The displayed objects arranged themselves into what the artist herself has described as a post-human natural history of the future, whereby a fossil or a credit card, incidentally one of the most interest intriguing objects in the show for me, that one, heralds a post-consumer future beyond the era of the Anthropocene. This latter artifact raises an intriguing question. What will future generations make of the fossils of those small embellished plastic rectangles that the humans of the late capitalism era have endowed with so much value? Yet Horohowski offers us more than the familiar lamentation over the passing of man and his worldly wealth. As Christina Schmidt has put it, um, the artist's more than vaguely vaginal imagery suggests a gendering of the dialogue. It challenges macho modernism's tragic heroic quest for mastery, so evident in the Jeremiads by the various Anthropocene-era male prophets of doom and gloom who seem to take delight in pronouncing our imminent death. Club Disminution, in which the diminishing returns also refers to the seemingly pointless activities such as straightening kelp, drying it and fitting it into cuboid shapes, 
envisages a future beyond the human. It thus becomes a quintessential example of art after the human, still appreciated as art from our human position of here and now, yet appreciated precisely for its placement against the horizon of extinction. In its playful reflection on the passage of time, the work seems to be encouraging the United States to join the club of formerly great nations and have been who lament the wasting of past glories. And Britain is also in that club. Yet Schmidt insists, and I would agree with her, that Club Disminution is not a depressing show, although it may be a melancholic one. Calmly and not without humour, Horahowski proposes that we dare look into the dark. We can face the sunset, her work argues. Club Disminution gathers in the fading light and dwells affectionately in the lengthening shadows of the human age. So, if we humans can never face the sun, what does it mean for us to be able to face the sunset? <coughs> this question has been addressed, although from a slightly different vantage point, by photo artist Penelope Umbrico, perhaps best known for her large-scale project Suns from Sunset from Flickr. Begun in 2006, when sunset was the most tagged word on Flickr, the project explores ideas of originality and replication in the culture of online sharing. The artist zooms on a snapshot she finds that features a sunset. That's not hard to do, as you can imagine. I'm sure you all have taken photographs of sunset at one point in your life, and if you haven't, your family members have. Um, then she uh, resizes it and she adds it to the ever-growing grid of burnt-out white globes placed against orange-red background. These sand tapestries are then displayed as large printouts on gallery walls, but also return to the internet in different guises, as small grids, a screensaver, a set of virtual postcards. It is therefore not the banal visuality of the sunset, but rather participation in the collective practice of sharing something you cannot claim authorship over that is of principal interest to Umbrico. Yet she also admits to being interested in the sun as the light source and the transformation of this light source both on the level of image and matter. Alongside her exploration of the digital environments, Umbrico's concerns are also aligned with the traditional perception of photography as a practice of drawing with light and with the energetic transformations its geological actions undergo on the internet. In what sounds like a playful rebuttal of the more solemn tenor of certain philosophical propositions about the death of the sun, Umbrico pronounces that the sun is dead, but we make our own light, and then goes off to rephotograph the suns from Flickr as displayed on the screen with her iPhone, and to explore the new light effects produced in the process. The result is a follow-up project, Sunscreen, in which sunset-like hues merge with a moiré pattern caused by the superimposition of the pixel grids, meshes, or dot patterns upon an image. The image then emits an uncannily beautiful light, which doesn't belong to the sun anymore, but which is not entirely ours either. Yet our human perception, with its specific visual apparatus and its color recognition capabilities, is required to acknowledge this very denaturalization of the sun into a moiré pattern. In other words, the denaturalized sun needs the human body to experience this denaturalization. Umbrico's playful project can be seen as an unwitting response to the philosophical problem posed by Jean-Francois Lyotard in his essay, Can Thought Go On Without a Body, first published in 1987 and included in The Inhuman. Lyotard declares there that the sole serious question facing humanity today is the solar explosion that awaits us in 4.5 billion years as a result of which everything will come to an end. The sun's death presents itself to us as the ultimate event of extinction, and thus as the ultimate sublime. As Leotard points out, after the sun's death, there won't be a thought to know that its death took place. Yet the universe will, of course, know about its death. It will see, record, and no doubt respond to it, but in a language that far exceeds human communication models and structures. Having outlined the somewhat bleak yet still rather remote prospect of the total annihilation of life, Lyotard, as you will remember, because there was a time when everyone was reading Lyotard, uh, Lyotard then proceeds to mock the efforts undertaken by the cyberneticists of techno-capitalism to make thinking materially possible after the change in the condition of matter by shifting life to other galaxies in order to liberate it from the throes of the dying sun. 
This process seems desperately grotesque. As for Lyotard, embodiment constitutes the very condition of thought. Our software, mind, philosophy, language, is, a code, is codependent on, therefore constituted by, and constitutive of our hardware, the body. So even if embodiment is seen as epiphenomenal rather than necessary in the development of the human, Lyotard recognizes that rather than entertain fantasies of extricating human <coughs> intellect from its material shell, uh, the way that Nick Bostrom about whom Claire talked yesterday does, we would be better off getting to the bottom of the desexualized and yet so very gendered dream of disembodied post-human thought. From this point of view, the actual disaster that should concern us involves the disappearance, not of the solar system as our matrix of reference, but rather of the body, that is of extinction of the human as we know it while we are still around. Accusing philosophers of extricating matter from their writings, Lyotard reminds us that the materiality of the human and of the universe needs to be read alongside its technicity with matter being taken as an arrangement of energy created, destroyed, and recreated over and over again, endlessly. He, he pinpoints that, as anthropologists and biologists admit, even the simplest life forms in Fusoria, uh, which is you know tiny algae synthesized by light at the edges of tide pools, and now they are called protista rather than infusoria. So they, um, a, few a few million years ago, um, are already technical devices. Any material system, says Leotard, is technological if it filters information useful to its survival. If it memorizes and processes this information, that is if it intervenes on and impacts upon the environment so as to assure its perpetuation at least. Positioning the emergence of life in early microorganisms as a technical process, Lyotard goes beyond the humanist logic of originary technicity that shaped the work of his contemporaries such as Bernard Stiegler, whereby it is the human that is seen as constituted by and emerging with technicity. For Lyotard, technicity is already the condition and driving force of primordial life. Picking up on this idea, I want to suggest that the process of the emergence of life also reveals itself to be inher inherently photographic with light being needed to initiate photosynthesis, that is to make a lasting change on an organism and then triggering off further changes. Yet, even if we continue pursuing this expanded understanding of photography as a non-human process that exceeds human acts involving cameras and photosensitive material, we are nevertheless returned here with Leotard to the phenomenological experience of light cast upon a human body located on the earth which is being lit by its middle-aged sun. Indeed, for Lyotard, corporeality is the condition of knowledge, but also of the phenomenological experience that enables openness, generativity, and generosity, and that allows for the transmutation of the technical action of information transfer into an ethical act. This returns us to the issue of the human's inability to face the sun, yet still having to take on the task of facing the sunset. The death of the sun, the universe, and ourselves is thus repositioned here from an ontological to an ethical political problem. It's because being able to face the sunset also means coming to terms with the problem of energy and of the depleting resources not just from the solar domain but also from the terrestrial or more specifically subterranean realm. Being able to share the sunset in the umbrical manner hints at the possibility of thinking, even if not yet actually implementing, a more generous, less exploitative mode of engaging with those resources. It's precisely this mismanagement of energy sources as fossil fuels by the human that is referenced as one of the symptoms of the Anthropocene, a state of events that has resulted in the change of the composition of the atmosphere and thus in the alteration of the nature of life that reaches us through it. As Colbert writes, citing the chemist Paul Crutzen, owing to the combination of fossil fuel combustion and deforestation, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air has risen by 40% uh, over the last centuries, while the concentration of methane or an even more, uh, an even more potent greenhouse gas has more than doubled. Facing the sunset is therefore a way of suspending what Finnish philosopher Terry Vaden has called fossil sense. An assumption that because things have been a certain way for the last 150 years, with the intertwined logic of economic growth and fossil fuel exploitation shaping our modern way of life, that they will always be this way. 
Fossil sense is therefore actually nonsense. It involves a forgetting of the deep time of history, fueled by myopic self-interest and species narcissism. Vaden claims that our lives are so intertwined with fossil fuels that our desires are the desires of oil, our dreams the dreams of coal. The modern human is therefore himself fossil fueled, with the very core of not just his, her, physical, but also economic and socio-political identity being shaped by hydro hydrocarbons. To extend the concept and metaphor we have been working with here, we can go so far as to suggest that while our own bodies are made of the same star stuff, they now also carry a record of industrially produced hydrocarbons, shards of coal, remnants of oil, or indeed that we ourselves have become a photograph and a fossil of our way of life. As Andy Salminen puts it in his poignantly titled essay, Photography in the Age of Fossil Nihilism, when a life form lives of fossil fuel, it will gradually become fossilized itself. Living under the cloud of oil fumes and global pollution, we seem to have forgotten about the sun. Grand as this proposition might sound, I want to suggest that photography can be mobilized to address the present fossil crisis in two ways. <coughs> By expanding the temporal perspective from which this issue is normally seen, or not seen, as the case may be, and by helping us outline a different, less deadly solar economy. Some claim that it can most easily undertake this task by serving as a record of the terrible damage done to the environment. We can reference here, for example, the series called Oil by Edward Bertinsky, which features large-scale images of oil fields in Azerbaijan, the US, and Canada, discarded of burning um, tile pyres in California, and oil refineries. These predominantly bird's eyes view images of what, from above and afar, look like digitally enhanced landscape paintings for the HDR age, are intermingled with equally large yet short face on images of ruined car factories. This kind of representational art is no doubt important in being able to visualize the environmental destruction and our damaging relationship to various sources of energy, including the sun. Yet, there is also a danger that these images will actually perpetuate the act of forgetting about the sun, with aesthetics serving as an anesthetic against the urgency of the environmental situation. As the increasing proliferation of images of disaster and suffering in various media testified, images you know, that could be easily called ruin porn, there is no evidence for perception being a trigger for, ma for action, especially for moral action. Indeed, sentimentalism or moral outrage aside, visual oversaturation may actually lead to non-action. Ilka Hansky argues that due to the way our sensual and cognitive apparatus has evolved, we humans are only able to perceive a small region of space and a short length of time. We could therefore conclude that evolution has made it impossible for us to truly see evolution, and hence also extinction. This is why we shouldn't overestimate the role of documentary and representational photography that takes environmental issues at its topic. Yet to state this is not to argue for photography's inherent weakness. Indeed, the argument of my paper, and I'm wrapping up here, is that photography is a quintessential practice of life, not just in the sentence that today it records our lives non-stop, but also in the deeper philosophical sense of encompassing life as duration through making incisions in it. In other words, all photography, with its capacity to capture light and make it act upon surfaces, acts as a cue for the goings-on of deep time, well beyond human control and human existence. Salminen goes so far as to suggest that in the fossil nihilist age, photography acts as a reminder of the sun and thus of life itself. It's in this idea that the two temporal lines of my talk, one oriented towards the past, the other towards the future, come together. Photography as an embalm and a carry of imprints testifies to the continued existence of solar energy and to its photosynthesis enabling capabilities. To say this is not to rewrite the traditional narrative about photography as being about life rather than death in any straightforward and naive way. Yet rhetorically placing photography under the horizon of extinction, a horizon under which it has arguably unfolded on a material level since time immemorial, has allowed us to come out on the side of life and to think fossils beyond the currently dominant fossil nihilism. Fossils and photographs, fossils as photographs, can therefore be seen as more than just forms of memento mori. They are also in ethical injunctions 
pointing and reaching out to life in both its actual and virtual forms. Citing Greek counsellor and philosopher Thomas Attic, Tom van Doren writes in his book Flightways, Life and Loss at the Age of Extinction, that in choosing to grieve actively, we choose life. This is precisely where photography is a process of fossilization that keeps a record of time becomes an ethical task, a form of countermourning the passage of time by casting light on solar light. By turning and returning <coughs> to the sun, we can take first steps towards envisaging a new energetics, one that develops a more ethical relationship to fossils as layers of ancient, non-human death. Photography is an original practice of light, now often undertaken under the glow of electricity as often as under the glow of the sun, can it get us to engage with light anew, even though in its present digital setup, it is also contingent upon energy borrowed from oil, a light distilled from death. And as a kind of postscriptum, I would like to show you uh, an art project of mine. Um, it's called um, The Anthropocene, a local history project. And it's a kind of visual coda to what I've just presented. I have to briefly say that I went to, uh, and I was already working as a professor, and about seven years ago, I decided to go to an art school and train as an artist. And I kept this secret from my colleagues so they wouldn't think I had too much time. And I was thinking I'll keep on doing philosophy separately and I'll just do art. And obviously the resolution lasted till about two minutes and it started kind of cross, one started cross-pollinating the other. Uh, photography has started playing more and more kind of important role in my own practice, but it's also changed the way I do philosophy better or the worse, probably worse, but anyway, <laughs> this project, it's still in the making, it's just the first rough cut, it's supposed to be an artist book, as, um, kind of a sequel to, to my philosophy book on the Anthropocene, um, and it's going to be a series of diptychs, about, I will not comment, I'll show in a minute, just 70% of the images are mine, about 10% are borrowed from other artists, and 20% are from archives, both historical archives and contemporary archives such as Flickr. You can recognize Horohowski here, first one. Second one is mine. There's also a remediated project by Sujimoto, which is badly photographed with a mobile camera with light cast upon it. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Well, thank you for that talk. It was very stimulating. Um, and the, the postscript really worked well for me because right before you showed that, I started to formulate a question about um, the um, unrepresentational like photos in, in your book, The Minimal Ethics. And so I saw a couple of images on the screen that that, uh, that looked like images from the book. And um, it helps to have this other reference, but I guess my question does remain, how is it that, um, could you talk a little bit more about the problematic aspect of representational mm -hmm. photography in mm -hmm. the age of anthropocene. Sure, um, and it's so that's something I'm working on at the moment. Actually, trying to think about this idea of human vision and non-human vision, and and uh, working through this very interesting book by Lyle Rexel about photography and abstraction came out a few years ago. Um, 
And uh, what Rexel is trying to do there is trace this kind of non-human vision going back to the early days of photography and looking at non-representation and thinking that representationalism as the belief that, you know, in the whole kind of indexicality of the photograph, what's in front of the camera that makes its way to the, to, you know, to, to, to the medium, to the photosensitive surface, has also shaped a very particular way of understanding photography. And so, in a way, but what I'm trying to do with this, and especially with, with this project here, is avoid setting up an opposition between, like, representationalism bad, so I will now show you non-representationalism, because that in itself is a contradiction which can't be executed. So in the same way that, you know, we can't write ourselves out of language while we can be, as long as we embark upon a, you know, a philosophical practice of arranging arguments, speaking in sentences, so we're already within certain traps, is the same problem with representationalism. So while it remains, so in, obviously that's why maybe uh, my uh, photographs of extinction are slightly different, or threatened species are slightly different than those of uh, Edward Bartinsky or Andreas Gursky, those kind of large-scale bombastic images that are supposed to shock and awe you into, well, I think buying them for banks, really, because I don't think they are supposed to shock you into changing your environmental behavior. I mean, the whole kind of vulgarity of the price of the art market around photography and what's causing... So what I'm trying to do, say, it's like, okay, if we're doing representation, let's try and do it kind of badly, playfully, drawing from practices of, you know, and obviously, and Haraway's always been an inspiration for me in one way or another, trying to work within certain constraints and limitations, but also going back to, you know, early days of photography when, you know, photographs were black and white, and as, as uh, uh, Rexel points out, uh, photographs, we knew that people knew that fo photographs were translations, and they were uh, rather than direct transfers. But something's happened with this kind of proliferation of the image that it seems to stand when you show somebody, as Alan Sekula said, a picture of your dog, you say, this is my dog, and people know what you mean. So that, so I'm trying to somebody denaturalize, if you like, that relationship without trying to present non-representational photography because that seems to be, to me, a philosophical impossibility. So a critique of representationalism, and we could do it through, you know, a number of different philosophical traditions. Lots of people have undertaken it, you know, going through, through you know, Derrida and others, through to Karen Barad recently. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I was I was really struck by the kind of fossil and, and photographic uh, link that I never thought of, but it's a beautiful um, a, a, you know, beautiful connection. But I was thinking of a kind of in-between of rubbings, and uh, particularly like touristic rubbings of stony surfaces, uh, you know, particularly like gravestones and stuff, but all the way through Max Ernst's Protage and Zhu Bing's rubbing of the Great Wall. And I'm, I'm just kind of wondering if the shift from the ocular to the haptic is at all useful in this in this discussion. I think, you know, I think absolutely it would be, although what happens with that, it also mobilizes a very specific kind of human practice of mobilizing the body into that, but also it opens up certain two-dimensionality of photography, which obviously fossils do anyway. So I think it would be a very interesting kind of line to follow, but I have to admit I haven't done any work on this yet, but thank you for the tip. I think I'll, I'll think about it more. Fantastically interesting talk. I would really benefit from hearing you talk a little bit more about the relationship of photography and fossil fuels, particularly mm -hmm. your focus on light as energy and fossil fuels as kind of storehouse of that solar energy. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, so the idea was about, you know, photography. Uh, I tried to kind of mobilize photography as an attempt to get us to think about the sun and uh, as a certain, and obviously these days photographs are not just taken with the presence of the sun, but with the presence of, kind of other media. So uh, fossil fuels become here, well the relationship between fossils uh, posits a certain, if not equivalence, then kinship, if you like, between these kind of 2D and 3D imprints and the whole process of, of imprinting that goes beyond the human practice of photography. I'm also suggesting that within that present historical moment for us humans in the you know, early 21st century, with the problems of fossils have become very significantly linked with fossil fuels, it can throw light that differently. So what I'm doing here is presenting 
a series of associations, perhaps more in the way an artist would do than a philosopher would do, to throw light on something that has become uh, important, kind of historically and politically, but also important in the context of debates of debates on extinction. And uh, there is more. There is more where it came from, but uh, um, just trying to to. I'm trying to be careful with that, and I know that you know it is taking a certain risk, and I'm wary of not just setting it up as a metaphor, saying, oh, you know, photographs are like that. So I'm trying to trace a certain material uh, connection, if you like, between those different forms, and that layering. If you see, you know, if you see those kind of fossil fuels, uh, I mean, they become they become fuels, but they are first of all fossils, and then humans turn these fossils into fossil fuels. They are remnants of a certain accumulation of geological time, and then reading them. So I'm thinking with photography, uh, in a way, the, the kind of those remnants have already, photo of the, the beings have already photographed themselves through becoming those kind of imprints in that geological stratigraphy, if you like. But then we're doing something with them. And I'm asking the question, could we, by returning to thinking about photography differently, change our relationship to, to fossil fuels? Obviously, the answer is most probably not, because you know the mighty have tried to change our relationship to fossil fuels to manifestos through you know. But people, you know, I think Naomi Klein's book is very good on fossil fuels, but she shows everything. But people who the only problem with it is that people who believe in it, it's a problem, uh, will read it and think well, it's a problem, we should do something about it. And people who, and she's also showing those who don't believe in fossil fuels and in the, uh, in the climate change, it's not that they don't really believe in it, they believe it hurts their economic interests too much. So in the sense, I'm very aware of the certain limitations of what an art practice or indeed, you know, continental philosophy practice can do within the certain, um, uh, and even so providing this uh, series of uh, intellectual uh, affinities in a perhaps playful way might be a way of, uh, you know, can either do melancholia or I can just try and play while there is still time. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks Joanna, that was really fantastic. I love that you have moved into doing art. Uh, I've never been that courageous, so I really appreciate that. Um, my question is, I, li I really think this idea of Harrison's that you, I guess, are you know, rebuilding upon, um, of photography as sort of being as old as the sun and as being sort of geological, it really, I really like the way that creates a kind of different genealogy for photography, a kind of geological genealogy, and one that can, I think, interestingly be put in discussion with or contrast with, let's say, Walter Benjamin's genealogy of photography as mechanical reproduction, because uh, sun is not, and light is not necessarily built into that genealogy, but it focuses more on, I mean, rubbings, as Lane suggested, being, you know, an early version of, uh, perhaps of that, but also other kinds of stamping and, and, and geological, so the earth connection is really there, but I wonder what happens if you put if you think about those two genealogies mm -hmm. in dialogue with each other, and then at the risk of you know, having the technology question for every talk, um, I wonder if what happens with Harrison if he doesn't think about the production of the photograph as geological, but then of course not the reproduction in, in Benjamin's sense, and thinking about whether the non-human, for you, or the idea of non-human photography might also be thought of not not only in terms of um, stars, minerals, geology, and so forth, but in terms of techne and the way in which photography after extinction could be imagined in all sorts of ways in which we, as humans, in collaboration with non-humans, could set up, acting at a distance, mm -hmm. uh, technologies that would, uh, on satellites that might circle the Earth or in places on the planet, that might, for long periods of time, after we're gone, continue to make these kind of photographs. I don't know if you've thought mm -hmm. in thinking mm -hmm. about non-human photography yeah. after extinction, if that's mm -hmm. also been a way you've been thinking. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you for that, um, for, for that question and for that line of thinking. Because um, 
And I think I, I agree with you that what I'm trying to do is counter a certain you know, series of photography. And as some of you might know, uh, you know, photography as a discipline in serial photography is quite conservative compared to, hasn't really had too much of a cultural studies moment. Uh, hasn't had, uh, I mean, it had in some circles, but it's still very much wedded to art history. Certain forms of interpretation are still very, uh, very linear, very humanist. Um, so I think the, that's why I got quite excited about rereading kind of the inhuman, Leotard's The Inhuman, when he uh, reads, uh, you know, he finds that technological moment in Protista, or in Fusoria, as he calls them, this kind of early algae, which, you know, for him, already have and undertaken that process with early life, kind of ent entering that process of photosynthesis and then transferring it as well. So it's both kind of uh, making images, but also copying them, even though not always faithfully, which, which that process is associated. And again, I'm kind of aware that what we're doing is, or I'm doing with this, is introducing a series of... Uh, similarities, if you like, equivalences, even though if I'm kind of saying, oh, no, I'm not doing that. It's a certain way of, you know, a philosopher playing with herself, perhaps, in that sequence of, of, of I don't want to say language games, because I'd like to think that I'm really trying to look at some of the stuff differently and to imagine a different way. For me, this whole process has been, uh, has been more than just uh, a kind of a game or more than just playfulness, although I have enjoyed it, I have to say. Uh, but but it's been more about, it's really changed the way I understand certain forms of connection and those kind of relation. And one of the books that turned me into thinking about kind of deep time as well as, well as I mean, obviously I think we've all kind of read similar books when we are in this room and we've worked through a particular kind of post-humanist tradition and we might have affinities with this or that thinker. However, what also got me thinking was kind of David Christian's book about maps of deep time. And part of me was fascinated by thinking about a new version of it is, is uh, you know, um, Noah Yuval Harari's Sapiens that came out recently. And part of me was fascinated, oh wow, well, history, let's do it, starting from the Big Bang. Part of me was also horrified around a certain lack of a kind of critical framework for introducing these scales, questions of scales, and then whizzing up and down that kind of pole of scale without you know, looking at points of stoppage and the moments that we have ourselves created. So that kind of, so what I'm trying to do with that is, is have this thing this thinking of deep time, but also the re reintroduce scale or structure or anchoring, if you like. And in that sense, you know, photography, there is a moment of opening up photography to the danger of saying, oh, everything is photography now. Of course it is, and yet obviously there is a very specific, uh, you know, human practice of photography, not just with galleries, but people doing stuff on their mobile phones, about which I'm also doing work, and it's a kind of almost separate work. Uh, but which also matters and which, which does something. So, a bit rambling. Yeah, I sort of want to pick up on the question uh, of the technological and scale of time. I think to ask you to think a bit about the varying scales of time in the photographs you show. I mean, I was so struck by the imprint of the credit card that not only fossilizes the credit card, but also gestures back to the time when we put our credit card down and the imprint actually mattered. Uh, and then you show Tsujimoto, and through the long exposure, you get a different feeling and scale of time than some of the other images, the flicker images. So how are you thinking about and sort of folding out these different scales of time um, as a way of refusing the fossilization of the metaphor? Because I love, I love that move, and I think that's, that's the move. Um, at least the one I love so much. <laughs> But how, how are you thinking those? Well, it's, it's also for me, it's a way of returning through photography to some of the philosophical questions that partly I have been trained to think with and think about, but I have never been quite satisfied how, you know, traditional philosophy, continental philosophy, which is where I come from partly, has dealt with. So, you know, the concept of time as organizing a certain you know, framework for our understanding and the way photography has foregrounded the certain presentation of time and processes of duration. But also it allows me to work with a concept which has been important for me in my kind of, you know, last few years, the concept of the cut. So while the notion of duration and thinking about time as duration, you know, be it by Bergson or Deleuze or whoever you want to do that, is important, I think for then to return to that 
you know, moment of the historicized moment of the anchored human who takes a certain responsibility and develops a discourse and a narration about something, you know, while also giving an account of the cuts she or he makes. And the camera is a very useful device. And maybe that's why I've always been uh, much more interested in photography than in film. I mean, I've seen some films in my life. My first <laughs> photography show was called I Never Go to I Don't Go to the Movies. And people would ask me, really? You know? <laughs> and I said, no, no, I've been to the cinema a few times. But the idea was thinking about I was trying to investigate uh, and why am I so interested in photography? And photography gave me these forms of pleasure that maybe I, you know, philosophy I always thought of as hard work and pain and obviously pleasures were there, but you need, but photography was much more unproblematic. I just really liked it, I like going to galleries, I'm much less critical, much less cynical. And I was just trying to, to then theorize my own likeness. I was getting too neurotic about liking it too easily. And I was thinking, well, why do, am I not so hard on photography? And then I realized what it was doing as a device, as a practice. And for me, it was functioning precisely as this device of incision. Mm -hmm. And also pushing me to, to think and to see as well <coughs> that moment of the cut. And obviously, the cuts in the, uh, incisions undertaken in the universe are not, very often not human. It's very rarely that they are. But sometimes they are. And this is this very rare spectrum for which the cuts are undertaken by the human and for which the human can actually take responsibility because you know, not all we, he, she can take account of or responsibility for, but well, they can, that, that very, very narrow spectrum is what I called ethics. It's almost like a thin fossil, this mm -hmm. kind of thin spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the difference between fossils and photography is, of course, that the, the cut that uh, fossilization does is, is an infinitesimal amount of, of fossils that survive from uh, from previous um, eras. So I, I'm wondering how you deal with that because uh, the analogy mm -hmm. stops there but the mm -hmm. photography is usually not lost. Uh, I mean we do some of that but in terms of past life it's, it's a yeah, well, that question, yeah, that question connects with the previous question about temporality and times. Well, photography, if you, if you go back to people, you know, like Lynn Margulies, for example, and her theory of, of perception, and looking at, you know, the, the most important thing that organisms are characterized by is perception, the fact that they make images of other organisms, so rather than any other more developed kind of uh, behavior. Uh, so that perception is a form of image making in some sense. Of course, it's not yet a photograph if we're applying a conventional understanding, but for an image to be an image, and Tim Ingold is somebody who's done a lot of interesting work on it, to an image to be an image, there has to be a temporary fixing, even if that, you know, uh, you know, duration of vision or a persistence of perception or whatever film scholars have called this. So there is already, there needs to be a certain moment of duration. And if we're expanding scales and contracting them, suddenly that process of the creation of images becomes almost infinite. And that yet only some of these survive or become more meaningful or become noticed by you know, different organisms, not all of them humans. But there is that kind of certain uh, incessant process, I think, in both. And then obviously we humans give a name to, again, a very narrow spectrum of that in both cases. In both ca and also what we as humans see is a particular fossil through its, out, you know, through its uh, outline, through its uh, impression. It also corresponds to a certain way our visual apparatus work. There might be other organisms who see fossils and see across uh, geological layering very differently because they are visual apparatus or other apparatus, sensuous apparatus is very different. So what we see as fossils might be, uh, and in their kind of infinitude, might be a very different uh, thing for other organisms, big and small. Um, I was just wondering, and this is not, whether the other side of your, the other side of your project would be an opposition or an extension of the, if you're taking, uh, let's say what we've always naively perhaps thought as a human practice of copying an image and representation and then branching it out to a deeper time. Um, and then you make this brief remark, you're saying you're not reducing everything to textuality. But one of the, one of the other ways you could go is to see the human, so rather than going from the human and branching outwards, to say there's practices of technique, practices of inscription, practices of copying, of which a certain form 
generate something like the human. I'm thinking of Stigler's work where um, <clears throat> he sees a certain folding of technique, mm -hmm. the hands and the eyes mm -hmm. and so on, as then generating an epoch. Um, why, why I'm asking this long-winded question is because you then get um, the claim in Stigler, which I think is pretty hard to refute, <coughs> even though it's the same uh, technology, if you like, of inscription or copying. I mean, he talks about Ake cinema, but it's from cave paintings, but it seems, seems to be relevant to photography. Um, it takes on different stratas or registers and temporalities and um, signatures, um, which would then problematize uh, the extension from the human outward. There would have to be some significant rupture, mm -hmm. um, which I guess is a sort of continuation of our own question about, you know, there is a difference between the sun and the eye and, sure. and, and, and the camera, mm -hmm. and that it might be that epochal difference of archiving and doubling mm -hmm. that might be of some urgency today when we think of the questions about why we can't, mm -hmm. you opened with, why we can't imagine mm -hmm. a deeper time, but also the questions you ended with in, about Naomi Klein, we can all see it, but we can't see it. And part of that is not just we're taking images, but they're doubled and congealed and thawed mm -hmm. and, and invested in. Mm -hmm. Question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I mean, I think I should probably, uh, say that this project I'm working on, I think this project also has limited duration to it. This project is a vehicle for me to try and open something up. And I think the gesture of identified would have been possible. I would like to think it's kind of already there in a way. Uh, it's, that would be this gesture of the temporary stabilization and of the recognition of the temporary stabilization of the entity we, the human, have identified as the human and the kind of, you know, giving an account of that stabilization, but also then moving on to do something with that, so aka ethics and politics. And I think these are very important. And I suppose what, I think I've worked with questions of ethics and politics for a long time, and I think that gesture of uh, kind of, uh, not expanding from the human, but kind of returning to the human as the human as that point of unfolding, the point in which something happens, and something happens that is important to us humans in that kind of self-involved, narcissistic, but undeniable way, uh, I think is extremely significant. And there is a danger in some of these, um, you know, large-scale, big history, celebration or horror of extension projects becoming just kind of... Uh, you know, losing sight of the urgency of a, of a certain moment. So that's why I'm describing this project as a vehicle that allows, allows me to travel somewhere, to see something, to see connections differently. But I have no, unlike a number of you know, other philosophers at the moment, and unlike Stigler, which worries me, his recent books really worry me, I have no ontological ambitions. I don't want to build worlds. I'm kind of making arrangements, but I don't and pass them on as gifts to others, and saying, this is my world, and please follow me. And that model of, of uh, continental philosophy and that moment, so I think it's important that we recognize in a kind of shared way these points of thickening or unfolding, something that something happens, and recognize the importance of that. Otherwise, there will be no point doing academic work, scholarship, politics, whatever, but that moment I think is, imp is important to me. But also, while I'm talking about playfulness, I still I would like, I was having a conversation with Ron about it on the bus, I was thinking that rigor, philosophical rigor is still important to me. So even though I think I'm playing here, I'd like to think the certain trajectory and historical, human historical trajectory of being an academic, of studying text, of reading closely, of you know, working through text, of writing books, that still is of value to me. I don't think it's of value to the universe as such, but it's certainly to, of value to me through my own. And, and there, is, there is that recognition that is important. And that moment of playing is also, at the same time, I would hope, a moment of not giving up on a certain rigor but while also opening yourself to possibilities of, you know, throwing over one bridge too far in, in making those connections. So.